Welcome to the Current Trends and the Future of Education panel discussion. We have invited innovative educators from around the country to share their ideas and experiences related to learning and 21st century skills. Our first panelist is Sandy Dawes. Sandy is an instructor for Harvard University's WIDE World Online Professional Development Program. She is also a faculty member of Harvard University's Project Zero Classroom and Future of Learning Institutes, along with being a classroom teacher in Berlin, Connecticut. Bo Adams is the next member of the panel. Bo is a junior high principal at the Westminster Schools in Atlanta, Georgia. In 2010, Bo and Jill Go launched Synergy, a community issues project-based problem identification and solutions course for eighth graders. Our third panelist is someone with whom you've already become acquainted. John Hunter is a fourth grade teacher with Albemarle County Schools in Charlottesville, Virginia. He was named by Ted and the Huffington Post as the most influential TED Talk of 2011. Over the course of the last 25 years, John has developed the World Peace Game, a multi-dimensional strategic board game that requires his fourth graders to solve real world dilemmas. Please give a warm welcome to our panelists. So John, Bo, Sandy, welcome to my living room. <laughs> Thank you. It's very comfy. So, um, appreciate all of you being here. And again, to emphasize the point, we have a classroom teacher in John, a school administrator in Bo, and Sandy is uh, deeply involved in professional development and adult learning, and is also still connected to the classroom. And so. Uh, as we're having this conversation about 21st century skills and teaching for tomorrow and the conference through lines, uh, wanted to make sure that we had the perspective of each of you out there represented. And so we put this panel together. Um, I'm sure you can understand that if they're up here on the stage, I highly uh, respect the, the abilities and expertise of these three individuals. And so uh, I. I I'm, I'm looking forward to this conversation, um, so much so that I think I've pestered them a little bit in the past seven to ten days with emails and phone calls because uh, I, I'm ready to have this conversation and I kind of inched my way towards that the last few days. And so uh, uh, really thank you, all three of you, for participating you. in this event. I want to get uh, right into it because I want to hopefully have some time at the end for the audience to do some Q&A with you. So uh, the, the first thing I, I want to ask is, what are your thoughts and reflections on day one of the conference? Because some of you led sessions. John, you, you definitely uh, did a keynote presentation that we all deeply enjoyed. And so what are your thoughts and reflections from yesterday? I think for me, one of the things that I've noticed is just um, the culture that has developed here. People come in um, with this. Um, this keen sense of wanting to, to know and learn and understand. And it's, um, it's really palpable. It's, um, it's really exciting to, to have this learning and knowing culture. And um, it, it was uh, very evident on that first day. I would second what Sandy is saying, that the warmth uh, that you feel from this audience, there is a real feeling, a desire to be helpful to um, I mean, I felt it when I was giving the talk that, that people really want to do good and they really want to help people who can't help themselves so well. So that feeling carries me through this. And that I really picked up on yesterday. I would echo the same thing. The hospitality from the Martin mm -hmm. Institute and from Presbyterian Day School has been incredible. Uh, wonderful people. And I love the bookends uh -huh. yesterday of starting with the World Peace Game and hearing from John in the afternoon to finish mm -hmm. the day. Uh, the new movie cut, I had seen a previous version and loved the additions to this piece. I thought it was fantastic. That's Chris. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Great additions and, and loved the idea um, of creating space uh, for students to be in the moment with something that's really relevant and that matters to them and letting them wrestle with those things. That was, that was a big takeaway for me yesterday. Okay. Uh, well, connected to one of our through lines is the idea of understanding and what is understanding. Mm -hmm. And on this particular question, Sandy, I want to start with you because mm -hmm. of your connection with Harvard and mm -hmm. Project Zero. Mm -hmm. Project Zero is really centered around the idea of thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you attend that particular professional development, you spend an entire week thinking about thinking. Mm -hmm. And so 
uh, you've thought about this for a long, long time. So what mm -hmm. are your ideas about what understanding is and how it develops? Um, that notion of metacognition is so important for us to think about our thinking. And um, uh, we spent some time in the workshops yesterday coming up with a criteria. So, so what, is, um, what is understanding? And um, for some of us, it's the first time we've really surfaced it and really looked at it and put it on our radar. I think we make assumptions about what understanding is, but we don't always really know. So we started to come up with, with um, uh, a sort of criteria. So really, what evidence do we see when we know understanding? And of course, John, your, your game came up um, so much during it. So what evidence did we see as we looked at that um, uh, at that game, well, we saw, uh, we saw application, we saw uh, synthesizing, we, all of these elements that came up with our list from our participants about what is understanding was, um, uh, was in the forefront of what we did, so. Okay. And, and adding on that, John, I loved your comment yesterday about, and I've forgotten his name, uh, the little boy uh, that says, I'm living Sun Tzu, and uh, I understand that now. And you went on to say, there is no way that I could quantify that and assess that and represent just how much understanding he has there in that statement. And as one that focuses on assessment and instructional design, I just, that was my favorite quote of the one, so many quotable things that you said yesterday. That was my very favorite, because I like that idea of, that reflected so much understanding, you felt like, I don't need to give this kid a quiz or ask him a, a particular question. Well, oh, thank you so much. I mean, but you know what Sandy is saying, that idea of metacognition, and, and her work in multiple intelligence, intelligences, it allows so much latitude to what understanding could be or how it can be seen. You know, we tend to have a snapshot view. Mm -hmm. Do you understand in this moment, did you pass mm -hmm. the test, you understand. Mm -hmm. But you know, the long view that you have and what Bo's ideas over his career, you know, they open up and evolve. So I get the feeling now that understanding is a longer process mm -hmm. that can actually grow and change and deepen. Mm -hmm. So it's not a snapshot moment of now I understand necessarily. It could be an understanding that goes on for some time looking at your work mm -hmm. and how you have that idea of metacognition mm -hmm. in a larger sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I agree so much. I think understanding so much a journey rather mm -hmm. than a, mm -hmm. a destination mm -hmm. and watching my seven and five year old sons discover the world and be so curious about things mm -hmm. and, and then becoming re-curious myself. Um, I think of myself more as the principal learner in mm -hmm. the building rather than the principal teacher or administrator um, and to model that learning by being that principal learner and right. continuing on that journey yeah. right. and learn so much from y'all just yesterday. I get curious. I like that. That's good. And just to echo on that, I think um, one of the through lines for us here and, and us in the audience is the notion that we're seekers and that we're seeking to understand whatever that is. I had a conversation last week with one of my students and is it, it was, well, what skills will you need in the future? And um, this is, these are 21st century skills. And um, we, we kind of grappled with that because we talked about his job may not exist right now, but it will be in the future, so what skills will you need? And that puzzled him. What, you know, what do I do? I, you know, what will this look like? And um, it was a really powerful conversation about um, uh, you know, what his, what his um, future could and will look like. What are some practices that you've seen that promote the kinds of instructional strategies and, and more importantly, the, the, the learning that we've been discussing here at the conference? Well, John's work certainly stands out for me. I, another favorite TED talk of mine yesterday that I tweeted out the link to uh, Kieran Birsethi's talk about teaching kids to take charge. She started Riverside School in India um, and really talks about blurring the lines between school and real life and putting students into situations, both simulations and that realness of helping uh, make change in India. Students rolling Agrabadi incense sticks for eight hours and then going out into the community and talking to those people about child labor and getting change. Um, watching the students in John's class simulate world peace, but at the same time, they're in a real situation of conflict with each other. And that's not simulation, that's real, um, of having to learn to engage with each other in a constructive way and to learn to beat the game, not each other, like you closed with yesterday, yeah. I think. That's so right, though, that 
that there's a purpose to their learning that's not uh, rote, abstract, or just academic, that there's some meaning. I mean, we all want meaning in our lives. We want what we do to really have value and to mean something beyond just a, an exercise. So when students, you know, which we put in isolated situations where you will learn this because you will need it in 10 years, maybe. Algebra, for example, I was told, but I think you actually can use it. <laughs> but you know, having students in that kind of mindset, it dulls and, you know, you can talk to high school dropouts. It had no meaning for me. I saw no purpose in it. But what you're saying is, you know, give them purpose, have meaning in the world, in their lives that they can see now. This carries so much more impact than an abstract exercise. One of the greatest pieces of advice I feel like I got was that school's not just preparing students for real life. School is real life. Mm -hmm. And they have something to contribute now to the world. And I think the students that I work with in eighth grade at Westminster are much more cognizant and aware of what's going on in the world than I was at age 14. And they want to have an impact on water quality. And they mm -hmm. want to have an impact on childhood obesity. And if we create the space and time for them to do so, they love it. Wow. They take advantage That's right. of it. love it, exactly. Yeah, it really is about making that shift of us um, uh, creating opportunities so that they feel they can do these real life types of things. Um, we're having this great conversation, but there are, I want to be a realistic, there are some folks here that may be thinking to themselves, you know, I'm from a school and we can uh, point to a variety of matrices that say we're doing a good job. Mm -hmm. you know, we're graduating X percentage of our students and we're, every year we're, have, we're averaging X number of National Merit Scholars and on and on and on. So they can point to things saying we're uh, doing a good job. For, so for teachers and administrators and other school leaders in those kinds of situations, when parents are are happy and students are happy and possibly even teachers are happy with the current school situation, um, why, why should they consider moving towards the kinds of teaching and learning that we've been talking about? Well, you know, I think about um, the other professions and our mission as teachers together to professionalize our profession and medicine sees advances through research and development. Um, business uh, and design certainly see advancements through research and development. I think we have an obligation to be researchers and developers of our craft and of our science and to see ways to improve. The human condition is to learn. We're born lifelong learners. Schools don't make people lifelong learners. They help nurture that which we're already born with. So to be that ourselves, to continue to pay attention to the world's shift and change so that we're not left behind mm -hmm. um, in schools. We need to be somewhat on the cutting edge, probably maybe mm -hmm. not the bleeding edge because we're dealing with young children, but to, to think of ourselves as a laboratory for getting better each and every day. The idea mm -hmm. in Japanese of Kaizen, continuous improvement, mm -hmm. um, so that we're better tomorrow than we were today. I think also if we value those ceilings, that's the kind of culture that we're going to have. And um, I don't think there's a ceiling on learning. So um, if we uh, show that we value them and that's the end, that there, there's an end to it, then that's what will be the takeaway for our learners. And, and that, isn't, um, that isn't what learning is. It is about this lifelong learning. Um, and uh, it's, um, it's something I think um, culturally we have to continue to grow. I like that no ceiling in mm -hmm. learning. You know, we come to PDS here, Presbyterian Day School, and the headmaster Lee Burns, it, you have an oasis here. It's a paradise, an academic educational paradise. And yet, every time I, I talk to Lee, he's got another idea. He wants to keep pushing the envelope. Why, why is that? I mean, he's got it fine. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. But he said, like, what can we do to get better? So there's some human instinct that seems to be there, too. But also, you know, a visionary leader will know that we've, we're pushed by the children. They lead us if we watch them and observe them carefully. Mm -hmm. They've got a new idea. They've got a new technology to show. They've got some new interest. And so that drives, for me anyway, the, the desire that I must have as an educator to go forward and advance. I just listen to them, and the door opens, and I have to go through it. Mm -hmm. And so, Lee, <laughs> your continual question, I, I love that, because it really does typify 
what you want to have in a, in a leader, actually, to lead the school in questioning and being re-curious again and again. Mm -hmm. I think when parents in a school take time to be with each other mm -hmm. and exchange ideas and thoughts about parenting and rearing their children, mm -hmm. It's a pretty easy leap then to make for them that we teachers want to do the same thing, mm -hmm. that we don't have all the answers, that when I'm sitting in a classroom with 16 or 24 or 32 children, that I can really learn from my colleagues mm -hmm. and parents about how to reach and touch more children. And I, to me, that resonates with parents to see that we want to get better just like they do. What would you do in this situation? Or how could I create something akin to the world peace game in my own classroom or how do I get my students to be metacognitive <laughs> practitioners about their own growing and thinking and I think parents buy into that I think by and large they're on our side and on the same team with us about those mm -hmm. things oh, just David Perkins talks about asking questions we should ask questions and um, I think a thread that um, I hear here is this this notion of inquiry how can we um, um, move forward using these questions to um, to help inform us, and I love the idea of of looking and um, and seeking from our students, John, and um, allowing that um, inquiry to move us forward. And so much of what we hear with um, with Lee and with um, the Presbyterian Day School, what questions do we have? How can we make it better? One one of the things that I find exciting here, and I'm, I'm talking to my my local fellow educators. Um, is uh, I've lived in this region with exception of three years I've lived in this region my entire life I mean this is home to me I, I'm, I, I'm quite passionate about what we're trying to do here in the, in the Institute uh, but thanks to the Institute to my knowledge this is one of the very few if not the only time independent schools jubilee schools charter schools public schools have all joined together and are freely sharing information and trying to learn from each other and in the past six months, Jamie Baker, my colleague in the Institute, has really helped me understand this idea of independent schools and just how valuable to independent schools your independence is, Bo. Mm -hmm. And so to my public school teachers, I share uh, the aha that Jamie's helped me understand is because of your independence, you're, you're more you're more agile and you can more quickly implement change and innovation and you can live out there on the cutting and in some schools maybe even the bleeding edge because you're talking about smaller numbers of people mm -hmm. you're talking about a variety of of uh, things that are different in your situation and so for the for those in public schools who can't move at that pace sitting down with you and saying you're three years into this program Bo." Mm -hmm. What have you learned and how can you help us move into that direction as a district or as a huge 3,000 uh, student public school, how can we move in that direction? And I think that's of key importance and that's something the Martin Institute's really going to begin to try to facilitate more is that kind of conversation. Mm -hmm. You opened up your initial uh, response to this question, Bo, with the uh, of being kind of lab schools and I think independent schools and charter schools really can be that more easily in some instances than the public schools. Well and the other side of that coin I think the, um, the most powerful lesson in my career as an educator came from 25 years of research and practice from the public school world to bring professional learning community structure and ethos into the independent school world because we really lag behind there. The public schools way ahead of us in the sense of bringing teachers together to utilize your own best resource that to create that same space and time um, and freedom for people to congregate and share ideas and think about what is it students should know how are we going to know if they're learning it what if they don't know it and what if they already know it when they come to us um, and that came from uh, a long research background from public schools that we've benefited from immeasurably in the last five years so I think we're partners in this and they can learn so much from each other and be on the same team and not look at each other's yes. adversaries uh, well, piggybacking on that how can we foster this kind of culture within a school I think seeking out um, 
I think seeking people who have um, similar ideas, who have similar visions about the culture, um, and sometimes that starts in small pockets, um, but those small pockets grow. And, um, and we start in public schools, um, we're all about the data. Um, but um, what are the things that we, we can do that, that are innovative and creative, but are also yielding good data? And that brings more people into the pocket, which begins to change the culture more. And that's an exciting thing for me. Um, some of the um, public schools, um, are, and particularly at the secondary level, um, they're still very traditional. So um, uh, kind of uh, building with individuals, small um, learning communities, um, that is something that I've found has been really effective. I think com coming from public schools, I've been a public school teacher all my career, and, and uh, what I found refreshing, what I found uh, enlightening was uh, a recent visit to Seattle at the uh, National Independent uh, Association, Schools Association Conference was uh, uh, an extension of trust to me from the other side of the aisle, so to speak, that the barrier did not seem to be there that I had assumed was always there that uh, we were, as both said, no longer adversaries. Maybe we never had been. Mm -hmm. That may have been in my mind. And we are on the same team. And our, the children are all ours. And so we really must all work together because it's even more critical now than it's ever been. This is a, a very critical point for all of us in our existence. And so we really have to come together in this collaborative way that, that we see that works. And to have that kind of reception, that kind of trust, for me, changing a culture in a school is fundamentally trust and relationships. Yeah. And when you have that kind of relationship extended on that kind of level, that platform, that people are saying we're not on the opposite sides at all. Let's work together. We have different methods. Let's put them together. And that generates and translates for me down to a school level. People who are there go back to their schools and says, you know, I saw this public school guy. We can trust him. I saw the independent school person. They can work with us. And so we're starting to be synergetic, I think, in that way, and work together more because of that trusting relationship that we're now you know, trying to cultivate, really. Uh, going back to something Sandy said to answer your question, I think um, inquiry is so important mm -hmm. and creating a culture of questioning. Mm -hmm. um, a book that's had a huge impact on my life and career, The Falconer uh, by Grant Lickman, has a wonderful chapter in there about the art of questioning and that so much of our school mm -hmm. culture is based on answers mm -hmm. rather than being based on questions. And the real revolution in education, if it comes, will be when the students' questions become their own mm -hmm. and that's what guides them into the work that they're doing. And I think that starts with great leadership. You mentioned Lee and um, had the opportunity to work with Lee and Grant and Jamie at the NAS conference mm -hmm. and Lee explained wonderfully about the culture of questioning um, that can be created by the leaders, the teachers, the students, and to really nurture and welcome that questioning to say that we don't have all the answers, um, but we're really interested in the paths and the journeys that the questions can take us on um, in the innovator's way, that we want to be observing and questioning and experimenting and networking with other people and that connect, educate, innovate uh, tagline is so powerful, I think, in creating that culture that you're asking about. Right. If you want to queue up at the microphones, we'll take some questions from the audience. Uh, you mentioned the work of Grant Lick Lickman, and uh, I'm going to talk more about this this afternoon, but we're really pleased in the Institute uh, that we've partnered with him on some field research he's going to be doing uh, throughout the fall semester. Again, I'll, I'll refer to that more. But I encourage everyone here to note his name and his book, Falconer, and he also has a, a, a website uh, that I'll share with you this afternoon. S some really, uh, uh, really great ideas mm -hmm. that he has about the idea of leadership and innovation. Yes, our first question. Good morning. Good morning. I'm curious in hearing your, uh, your opinions about evaluating teachers based on the performance or scores of their students. What do you all think about that? <laughs> and, and Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Just the, not, none of these three individuals are from Tennessee, so I don't <laughs> think they understand the weight of that question. Oh, I see. So feel I'll free to respond <laughs> and, and enjoy your ignorance on this particular matter. Uh -oh. <laughs> I'll start by um, saying that. Um, 
I'm part of a community where we do benchmarks every six weeks and then the data gets published and then we get to look at the data and that's just part of um, who we are and what we do. But one of the neat shifts that um, we've um, really decided to make is, um, is to look at the results that each of us are doing and um, it even drills down to indicators so we are able to see, all right, so, and it's, uh, it's William, right? So William, I may find that in your US history class, um, you are doing all of these amazing things and these indicators are doing really well and I am kind of crashing and burning there. So what kind of conversation, what kind of um, small learning community can we put together so that I can learn and grow from you? And that's the kind of shift that we've made with our data. And so when we do make it public for our groups, we try to make it so that we're learning and growing together and that I'm finding the kinds of thinking routines and the kinds of things you're doing in your classroom so I can benefit and ultimately my learners can benefit. So that's the kind of shift we're making with that. I'll give a single teacher on the ground point of view. This is just my, my experience. My principal in my elementary school in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia very passionate, very committed, uh, courageous defender and advocate of children's rights and, and children's abilities, will pop into my classroom anytime and say, John, what's going on? What learning is occurring? Tell me about it. Show me this. And I realize my evaluation has started. <laughs> <laughs> this evaluation can happen anytime. It can happen all the time, any day. And so we're constantly in that mode. And of course, when you ask a question like that as a teacher, you know, the human instinct for me is to immediately feel fear. And you, oh, I'm, I'm going to be inadequate in some way. I'm a human being. She's asking because obviously something's missing. But if I stay with that feeling long enough and just live through it, go through it, and knowing her, we have a relationship, I know that at heart her, her true interest is in the safety and welfare and well-being of those children. She's not after me. She's after their success. And it may be that I've got some shaky parts that we have to go through to get that done. But those are my shaky parts. Those aren't me. And the me that is there, she's trying to talk to and help me to make whatever is there better. So if I can go through that fear, feeling of inadequacy, and I may be inadequate in parts, just live with it, go through it, we can talk together. And by her repeatedly doing that, oh, weeks and months at a time, you know, we, we're having a trusting, open conversation and I've become more comfortable in not knowing what she's going to ask and not knowing what I'm going to say. Living in that unknown moment, my evaluation is continuous. My evaluation is ongoing. My evaluation is every moment of every day with every child. Mm -hmm. I don't know how it looks on paper, but I know what it looks like when she's in the room with me and the children. And you can feel a living evaluation that carries beyond data for me. Um, I would like your thoughts also on assessment when dealing with children. We've got these middle schoolers and high schoolers who are preparing for college, and we all understand the importance of collaboration and communication, the need to question, but these kids are trying to make A's and B's to get into the perfect college or the, of their dreams. What can we do, or how can we get everyone to shift in their looking at what's really important, because these kids are trying to make, I'm, I'm, I don't, you see what I'm saying? I'm, the kids are trying to make A's and B's, but really what we want them to do is question and learn and be hungry for knowledge. And so how can we get the work? How can we get us all to look differently in helping them achieve their goals without having them be so focused on A's and B's and what they've scored on their SAT? I, th I think part of that is um, making sure the cart and the horse are in the right order. <laughs> um, and connecting that to William's question, and it, this will be a poor, inadequate answer to William's earlier question and tying it to you, what you're asking. Um, I think we need to develop a deeper sense of assessment literacy as a profession of educators. And if we can nurture that sense of pursuing inquiry and questioning and connecting to the real world and then we develop assessments that can help us know what our students and our faculties and our co-learners and co-teachers adults and children mm -hmm. are learning and those have relatively speaking easy to read metrics then I think that's okay but when we put the metrics first 
and that becomes an extrinsic motivator and it gets disconnected from what's really at the heart of the assessment and that's what's being learned, then I think we've gone astray. Right, right, and I think it's because it's efficient. Um, and so we really need to keep shifting from an industrial age model of school to more of a, this human relational trust-based uh, organic model of education. And I think when we do that and we have to keep pushing the research and development, we have to keep pushing the experimentation, we have to exchange practices and beliefs and thoughts with each other and what we're learning and discovering in that metacognitive way, um, I think if we keep pushing, we're going to get to a place where we really value assessment as a value added because it is helping us to understand that approach to passionate learning. Um, I'm sure there's assessment tied to the World Peace Game. We don't see a lot of that in the film per se, um, but assessment that is good assessment that helps us reach the hearts and minds of our learners in relationship, I'm all for that type of assessment. I would, I would second that so much because, um, for example, my daughter, she's a teenager, 16 years old, and she's thinking about college, she was thinking about it years ago, and that push is coming with her friends, her classmates, there is a huge desire to think about what's going to happen, how can I make the grade, what do I need to be prepared, and it's such an intense pressure that uh, she said, Dad, what do I do, what do I really believe and think? And you know, I realized I could tell her, being her father and having some authority, but then there's 600 other people who have opinions and ideas that she might be in contact with who could tell her something too. So what is she to do surrounded by that maelstrom of, of information, ideas, and opinions? It's almost overwhelming. So what, what I learned years ago, I try to do is example for me is better than precept. That you know, I can talk, I can tell, and people can give their opinions, but Am I living what I believe? Am I an inquirer myself? Mm -hmm. Do I try to strive and ask questions? And am I comfortable with not knowing and seeking to find out, being a seeker? Mm -hmm. And these kinds of examples, students see. You know, you may say something to them, but what are you doing? You know, do what I do and not what I say, that kind of thing. They see us and they watch us and they understand how we live. And if you're living the way you want to express, I think it's even stronger than saying. So it's almost as if you can, with less words, carry a greater weight sometimes. And that kind of model for assessment, in the World Peace Game, for example, but we, we, the students create a rubric for assessment with me. I never create rubrics in isolation and then give them to the students. They have to be a part, they have to own their learning and their understanding from the bottom up. And so the assessment is built together. I may have and yeah, knowledge of the SOLs and so forth they need to have in that assessment, so I'll encourage them to put them in. But they have ideas I have not thought of. So I have to listen and we have to have a joint assessment that they own so they can say, I know what I've learned because I started to build a tool that measures it from the beginning. And they share that with me. And then they can see the target. Exactly. Right? They know exactly. what target they're shooting at. Always, exactly right. They can see what the end is going to be before they get there and they see how they get there. Mm -hmm. Right. We're starting to see a lot of elementary schools, this was part of our discussion at dinner last night, yeah. seeing a lot of the elementary schools come up with rubrics in terms of grading. And we're seeing a kind of vertical articulation in that it, um, middle schools are now beginning to look at it, okay, what could that look like? Um, and because we're building this culture of learners and they're moving forward and there are expectations of knowing what the target is and they're getting to some of these traditional schools and they're like, wait a minute, that seems rather random, what's the target? Um, so it, it's a slow process, but I'm even seeing it move up because a lot of the kids that are graduating from high school um, are going off to college and needing remediation, and they're still not clear on what the target is. So um, yeah. it's, um, it's a process that is slow, and it is one that um, is um, often frustrating, but I think part of it is uh, the conversation about what kinds of questions, what kinds of um, learning um, uh, shows um, evidence of understanding. Mm -hmm. so. I, I think too we need to, when we figure out how to promote the purpose of failure in learning and that the first time we ride a bike we fall and the first time we walk we fall and what do our parents do when we start to walk and fall? They actually clap for us when we take a couple of steps and fall down 
If we could get that clapping for falling down and getting back up built into our assessments, that would be superb too. <laughs> okay, I'm right. I, know. Yeah. I, I want to close with this question, and uh, unfortunately, I can give each of you only 30 seconds to respond, but it's one of the conference through lines. If, if we're looking uh, to promote excellence in our schools and in our individual classrooms, what kinds of questions should we be asking? I think the shift um, for that should, and, and perhaps um, that's a, another cultural focus for me, is um, going from uh, teacher focus to learner, learner focus. What, what kinds of um, questions? This is, this is our target. This is our journey. What kinds of questions do we have about getting there? And, and that be um, sort of the jumping off point, the launching point for it. And I think that's going to be, um, or yield really um, amazing results. I would completely second that. It's, it's now student focused. The question is not almost what do I need to do? I think I know what I need to do, but I'm going to ask the students, what do you need? Mm -hmm. You know, you know things that are coming that I don't know and cannot see. Can you tell me what the future looks like from your point of view? You're going to be there and I'm not. What do I need to do for you so you can have that thing that you need, that you feel you need, you know you need, or you see coming? I think we need to be asking the kind of questions, how, we, how can we make school look more like the learning that happens before we put students in desks for most of the day, mm -hmm. and the learning that happens after we get out of college? Mm -hmm. um, if we could make school look more like that integrated, messy, complex nature of life, um, if we can ask those kinds of questions, I think we're going to be moving in the right direction. Audience, can you understand why I asked these three individuals to participate? I mean, was this not fantastic? Can we show our appreciation? Thanks, thanks to y'all. Oh, yeah. 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 So uh, I assure you all three of them would be glad to continue this conversation. Uh, a couple of them are presenting today. John's going to be in the exhibit hall uh, the rest of the day. Please, I encourage you to approach them, to ask them questions, and gain from their expertise. Uh, there are certainly others that are, have the same kind of expertise in the audience, um, and so I, I encourage you, this is not the end of the conversation. This was just a step in furthering it and, and contributing to, to, to the conversation. Uh, I encourage you, we all attend conferences, and we know that oftentimes the best part of the experience happens outside of sessions. It happens in the hallways. It even happens over dinner and back at the hotel lobby. So please continue to discuss these things because there are 500 experts right here. And they're not worried about grading tonight. And they're not worried about bus duty in the morning. They have a fresh mind. So, so please continue these conversations over lunch and elsewhere throughout the building. Again, let's thank our panelists.